Welcome to The State of Us. Real people with honest opinions and the future of responsible media. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Welcome and thank you for tuning in. This is the front page edition, a test of a new format. We're looking at possibly launching a spinoff of The State of Us that focuses on what the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times have dubbed the most important stories of the day. So we're going to be previewing that, and we want your reactions. There's a lot uh, to look at and get through, some more exciting than others. Amongst them, small donors equal big dollars, separated and far from equal in Charlottesville, racial divide. New details emerge in the Saudi case, and banks put Uber at a value of $120 billion. So we can't begin the conversation on all these incredibly important topics of which we'll spend no more than six minutes apiece without your friendly redneck liberal, Lance, Lance Jackson. Jackson. How are we doing today, folks? Here we go. So am I going first or you? Oh, I, I, you're itching. Okay. Well, I've got one that you didn't mention, and it has to do with how our president demeans women. That's yeah. the title of the article on the front page of today's New York Times, and President Trump referred to um, film actress Stephanie Clifford as horse face in a tweet on Tuesday after he had won uh, his court case by a federal judge dismissing the defamation suit filed by Miss Clifford, who was also uh, known professionally as Stormy Daniels. What's this? What's the Sorry. What's this article titled? Horse face, low life, fat, ugly. How our president demeans women. How president demeans women. Sorry, staring right at it, literally in the middle of the the page. I know. (laughs) And it says here, Mr. Trump has accused women of having fat, quote, fat, ugly faces and of repelling voters because of their looks. He called one woman a crazed, crying lowlife and said another was a dog who had the face of a pig. And he said Hillary Clinton's bathroom break during the 2015 presidential debate was too disgusting to talk about. He has repeatedly mocked women for being overweight. Um, That's just a few of the things. And what really bothers me with this is raising two daughters into strong young women is that if a, the president is talking like this, what are other young men thinking and what does it then set the example for them to do? I understand the president's an adult. He can do whatever he wants. He has the right, you know, First Amendment right to say and do what he wants. But then there's also the role of being a leader. And as president, you're supposed to set the national agenda. And is this what we want to be going on in our elementary and middle schools and high schools? You know, and, and that, well, the president says, mom, it's okay. The president said she's a dog. So why can't I say she's a dog? Because the president doesn't live here. <laughs> I understand, but then let's, I, let's I face it now when we're in school, well, my parents don't care if I call girls this, my parents don't care if I call women this, or they call teachers this, or whatever. I mean, what message are we sending to our young people when the leader of our country is saying this? And don't give me backlash about, like I said, First Amendment rights, and he's an adult. Right. There, there comes some responsibility, I believe, when you are in a position of power. We get caught and, up. And I mean, I don't know. What do you, how do you feel about this? Yeah. I just, this really bothers me. Not so much that the president's gutter trash mouth again. I mean, that's, that's normal. That's, I don't know if that's not necessarily newsworthy because you're either disgusted by it or you go to his rallies and you support him anyway. So I'm not here to say that's not a reason. I'm just saying what could be, in my mind, some of the ramifications of this kind of behavior and verbiage to the future of our society. Well, and I think we have to broaden the conversation too, because it isn't just about, I understand that there's, there's a particular issue, especially right now going on with how women are treated, how they're talked about. I get that. But I think it's bigger than that because we are having a lot of debates these days about political correctness. And I just like to say on this one, I, I think it's beyond that. I don't think this is a this is not a situation of being politically re- correct. It's about being a decent person to other people. You know, even if and this brings up 
for me anyway, a larger ethical debate you could get into. If you think, if you think something about somebody, is it dishonest if you spare their feelings and say something else? Um, well, sure. I mean, you're not telling them the truth, but if the truth doesn't help or further anything, then why say it? You know what I mean? Why, if the truth can't do good, what your truth is? Because again, these are just, whenever we get into, you know, you look this way or I look that way, these are all personal truths. I mean, one person. Right. But if my spouse asks, does this look good on me? Mm -hmm. I can tell them no. Because it doesn't. Sure. But, that, but that's different than saying you're a fat pig. Exactly. And you look right. That's what I'm saying. So there's insulting there, them. I'm not sure it's right. really, there's a correlation. That's my point with you. Is and they're also two different asking. Things. I mean, president, there's a difference. Right. These, these women did not invite the president's commentary. This is being on their unprovoked and demeaning presentation. Unprovoked and demeaning. That's, yeah. I guess, those are my two words there. Right. To counter, you know, not, and that's not counter, what I'm saying. It's not brand. political correctness. Right. Just for those people who might jump and say, oh, we're into this. No, I don't think that's what this is. Agreed. Agreed. Sorry. I think this is a flat case of, again, just when it doesn't hurt anybody to just be a nice person, why not be a nice person? The world's better when we're nice and, and respectful of others. No reason to comment. Well, like I said, what, what is your comment? I mean, do you think this could sets a bad example for the future sure. of America and how it's okay to talk this way because the president's talking this way yeah. about people. I mean, we look to, we know kids look all the time at celebrities and fit, you know, regardless of the fact that the president today is someone who was a celebrity before this, the president's always a celebrity, you know, regardless of who it is. And so the president's always one of those people that if they do or say something, there are going to be kids out there that use that as a justification for, well, it's okay to behave this way, you know? So whether it's the, whether it's our president today, uh, or a Hollywood actress tomorrow, it's all this same kind of thing of the reality is people who are in these positions in the spotlight, I think should be more sensitive to, uh, how they, how they behave. I would hope that we all are, but they in particular, because we've elevated them to that role model status. Uh, we want to make sure obviously that the model is a good one. You would think. Um, so something from the wall street journal today. So in case you guys haven't figured it out, the format is kind of this back and forth of just things that Lance and I picked out from the front page of the wall street journal and the New York times for the day that we're talking about, which is Wednesday, October 17th. Banks put Uber value at 120 billion. That's what I want to talk about next. You got any finals on this Lance before we. Nope. Um, skip go on? ahead. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, the IPO could take place early next year. And rival Lyft is also eyeing and offering in 2019. Now, the reason I found this interesting is because the eye-popping figure of $120 billion is nearly, or excuse me, is more than General Motors, Ford Motor Company, and Fiat Chrysler Automobiles are worth combined. So just wrap your head around that for a moment. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The... The large American car manufacturers, if you combine their value, the banks are saying that Uber's worth more than that. And now I'm not an economist, but just for a moment, Lance, I mean, these are one of those, it is kind of like a laughable moment of explain this to me, you know, explain, I understand, you know, value of of future potential, but holy crap, there's got to be a lot of future potential because they don't have products, you know, they don't have, I mean, it's literally a service, an app, and maybe that's part of why it's so valuable. There's no, there's no supply chain. There's no logistics. It's just one of those that's a little odd, you know, but we have a bigger picture of electric cars, driverless cars, all of these other items that you have to redo some of those major companies in the auto industry to provide those those things. And these companies aren't hindered by that. They'll just buy them and go. And as we looked, you and I have been looking at a map put out by, uh, I think it was the Sunday New York Times, about where people in America live. And they're concentrated in – certain locales where it doesn't always benefit you to own a car. So the growth of 
of Uber and Lyft and companies like that, I think are going to be tremendous in the future. And that's why the IPOs are so high because people are looking at something where they can make money. I'm not going to make money. You're telling me, you tell me all the time that me owning a car and paying car insurance and paying for gas and repairs is I'm being a dinosaur and it's not smart investments and it's not good and it's not the wave of the future and everything else. So if that's true, if what you've been saying to me over the last three or four years is true, then why not? Why shouldn't the IPOs for Lyft and Uber and these places, if you're, if it's going to be silly to own your own vehicle because it's going to be cost prohibitive, then people are still going to need to get around. But if everybody's moving from the middle of the country to the coast, and that's where everybody's living, and you can earn a living doing this. I mean, you're telling me that too, that you can work on the side and make more money driving for Uber than you can on almost anything else. Well, then why wouldn't you invest in this as a futuristic way to make money? Because you're looking ahead 20 years. You know, I mean, I've referred you to all the time. When I started college, the price of gold was under $200 an ounce. You know, if I had money then, I mean, if I was where I am now, economically, in 1980, I could have bought gold and I'd, I'd be living high off the hog. So now I have money. I have that kind of money. Should I be investing in Uber and Lyft? And many people are saying, sure. And the more people, because that seems to be the wave of the future. That's why it's worth so much. Sure. And well, in my initial reaction, notwithstanding, uh, it, and I know you it, know it could, that, it but could still, just you be jealousy. The, you asked it, me the it, question. It might be that I, I wish, as Lance proclaimed, this is the gold for me. I wish I had, uh, I had paid attention sooner because I knew about Uber relatively, really early on. Yes, um, and and have followed it, and I've driven for Uber. I mean, full disclosure, and for Lyft at different times. Um, and the other thing that I think is amazing about this is that Lyft, which is, I, I would say, by most measures, their closest competitor, is valued at $15.1 billion. I mean, just such a, you know, it's just such a huge, huge difference in your first get, to the game, so I guess. Right, but if we get driverless cars, oh yeah, then there's no cost. I mean, you don't, nobody has to pay you. Right, nobody has to pay the drivers. Uh, so now you're making even more profit. Yeah. You, you, you are, you can keep your same price, I do and wonder, it, though, increase your profit margin. how the driverless thing, it will affect the bottom line. And the question, of course, is always, is it a net positive or a net negative? Because you think about, okay, so we get rid of the cost of drivers, but now we do have to own the vehicles. We do, which are going to be more expensive, especially initially than your average car because of all this technology. Uh, we got to maintain the vehicles. There's that ongoing service. They're an asset that we always lose money on. You know, you're not, we're not going to sell it for more than we bought it for. Um, you get into fuel. I mean, there's a whole new world of expenses that Uber has not been subject to. Uh, yes, they're getting rid of this. The drivers take the bulk of the cut. But I do wonder, and I, obviously they have teams of people that have figured this stuff out by now or are actively running other models. What do those models say? They must say enough that they think it's worth pushing forward on their technology, but I do wonder what that, you know, how how big of a difference is it? Uh, and people are interested enough to take their hard-earned cash and invest in it. You're right. So so something looks good. Yeah. Or or the promise of something looks good. Always the question. So there you go. I mean, that's my answer to your question. Yeah. Is so, the, the upside is just so big. Yeah. So today we're as you guys know, we're we're testing out this new thing that we're the code name is the front page. Um, just an addition of the state of us where we kind of are taking away from what we usually do and that we're just trying to get through a bunch of different things going on and give you some thoughts. We want you to expand on those thoughts at True Chat O R G, Facebook and Twitter. But the biggest thing that we need you to do today is let us know once you've listened to this, if you like it. If this was available. Monday through Friday, by early morning Eastern time, would this be something you'd want to listen to? And also giving us a little leeway on this is the first time we've tried to do this. So, uh, you know, take it for what you will. What do you got, Lance? Well, this is a little blurb at, at the bottom of the New York Times. Okay. Um, but the, it says the liberal the, media. The search for so the storms missing. Mm. I'm kind of staying on the Stormy Daniels thing here. 
Okay. Uh, at least with the, the wording. But this is something that has interested me because we've been big here trying to talk about Puerto Rico for the last year and what we didn't do to help out other Americans. And this just says the search for the storm's missing. As rescuers combed through the wreckage, the death toll from Hurricane Michael rose to 26, but many more have been reported missing. Again, this is something that we're not hearing a lot about, but this is truly was a ravaging storm. And still, as of, I think, yesterday when I was flipping around um, on TV, thousands of people, maybe even tens of thousands of people, still without power. And so... And now there's pouring rain in Texas that are stranding people. I mean, 12 inches of rain per day or something like that. And rivers cresting 35 feet above flood level. Um, And this is just, again, people have died and they're still missing. And not really hearing anything about FEMA or what's being done. The president and his wife did were on the ground on Monday uh, talking to people and viewing the damage and handing out fresh water and talking to people, um, which is good. But again, what's happening here? And we really haven't heard either what happened to the U.S. Air Force Base that was in in the path. I know they flew a lot of their uh, planes up to us at Wright Pat outside of Dayton, Ohio. Um, but still I've seen a couple of pictures and it's just, I wonder what has really, what's really going on down there because there hasn't been too much media coverage and there hasn't been too much push on the president. I guess I'm just remembering um, New Orleans and president Bush and how he took a beating over how little they did. And here's another storm Um, A year after uh, Puerto Rico and just a week or so after what went up through South Carolina and North Carolina and Virginia. And it's just like, where's the push for the government to step in and take care of this? Or are we in a place now where, well, that's it's private. We're going to let everybody else take care of it. And because that was what we did in Puerto Rico. It was like, well, we'll sell a government contract to a company that has three employees and then they can't restore the power grid. And then, you know, it takes 12 months and still 30 percent of the people are without power and they're still finding people dead, you know, that have been missing for 12 months. And here now it's happening. Thousands. Right. And now it's still happening. I mean, these events are happening now on the 48 states of America and still not a lot of coverage. So it's it's one of those things that's just it's interesting to me. I mean, the death toll has slowly been rising and not a whole lot of coverage as to what role the government is taking or is planning on taking. I don't know what you how you feel about this, but it's just, it's just like it echoes by when, when 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 do you know, it's like your serious stuff. At what number do we get interested? Right. When does it matter? Apparently it doesn't. I mean, we have, you know, by real live good projections that the governor of Puerto Rico is supporting, you have thousands, not, you know, a hundred, thousands of U.S. citizens who died and the coverage lasted a day or two. No talk about how the system could be better, what the shortcomings were, it's just accepted, well, they're a territory of the U.S., their, you know, their infrastructure wasn't very good, so it is what it is. And I'm, I, I'm not okay with that as a citizen. Sorry, that doesn't make me feel very good about what my tax dollars are doing. You know, not, not that my tax dollars aren't helping other people, but that from a selfish perspective, so if something awful happens in this area, I guess I'm just SOL. I mean... <laughs> That's what that, that's to me, that's what that looks like is like, well, we'll kind of help if it's convenient, you know, Uh, and that's not to degrade FEMA or the work they do or anything like that. It's to say, what is up with the media and not, you know, they're all over when the storm happens. It's all, oh, look at the storm. But then after it's over, it's like, well, 
Oh well, yeah. You know, we covered we covered the sexy part, which is look at the look at all this awful stuff that's happening. Well, you're happening. talking about it four days before it right. even hits. Yeah, as yep. to here it comes, and we don't know the pattern, and we don't know how strong it, it's from a tropical storm and went to a, a category four. Well, we covered that for yeah. days on end beforehand. Then we stand in the middle of it and show you the pictures, and then we show you the aftermath 24 hours later, and it's like, okay, let's pack up and go to the next place. Yeah, yeah. We see Lester Holt, you know, putting the put the mattress up against his hotel room window because it's dangerous. And first of all, I'm like, okay, why are you there? You willingly went in the way of a very dangerous storm, which you've told people to stay away from. But th- that aside, aside from that, uh, on top of that, you have. Like Lance said, it's just it's like there's no follow up to these things. And that's the part that I think is the most upsetting. And it speaks a lot to what the state of us is trying to do, which uh, as a show, as a podcast, we've been working to shed light on those issues that the mainstream media either is not paying enough attention to or isn't giving the right kind of attention to. And that speaks, I think, to the format for this new uh, project that we're testing called The Front Page. We're using print media. You know, we say mainstream media, and we kind of just lump that into this big thing. Uh, And yeah, The Wall Street Journal and The New York Times are part of that, absolutely. Uh, But it is different, you know, than than cable uh, in a lot of ways. There's a number of things that make it different. We we did an episode called The, uh, I think, The Power of Print and Why It Matters. so go back and listen to that because I think it's worthwhile. We're trying to we're trying to bring some of that to you in a in a little different way. Um, the thing the next thing I want to talk about is not actually from, ironically, uh, is not actually from either of the front pages, but it is from the. It's called so you have the morning and evening briefing, which is this email that the New York Times sends out and says, "Here's what you need to know for the day. Here's what you need to know happened today, respectively, morning and evening." Um, and I think it's kind of interesting because I, I like to see what have they decided I need to know. You know, they don't know me. What what do I need to know? Uh, and what do you need to know? Because it's right. It's this general thing. Before we get to that, though, all the podcasts on True Chat are pursuing a common goal, and that is to provide open, honest, and respectful educations in a hope of educating people. If you think for any reason that we're not succeeding, uh, definitely email ethics at truechat.org and let us know what we can do better. Now, of course, if you just don't like this format or if you're a big fan of Lance, you can take to Facebook, Twitter, and others at TrueChat, O-R-G, TrueChat.org, Facebook, Twitter, and more. Let us know what you think of the new format. No, Trump's tax cut isn't paying for itself, at least not yet. Federal revenues rose slightly in 2018 fiscal year. But that doesn't mean the $1.5 trillion tax cut is bringing in more revenue than it's losing. The Treasury Department, so just so everybody can be clear, not the liberal New York Times, okay, the Treasury Department, which is part of Donald Trump's administration, the Treasury Department, sorry, going to say it three times, going to pull a Donald here for you. Very, very, very. Yeah, very, very, very. The Treasury, Treasury, Treasury Department released figures Monday So showing that the federal budget deficit widened by 17% in the 2018 fiscal year to $779 billion, which is an unusual jump for a year in which unemployment hit a five-decade low and the economy experienced a significant economic expansion. But the increase demonstrates that the tax cuts President Trump signed into law last year have reduced federal revenues considerably, even against the backdrop of a booming economy. Now, you're, you're out there listening and, you know, you're like, Justin, Lance, you know, this is, I like listening to you guys, but when you get into this economic stuff, it gets difficult to really understand it. And the New York Times anticipated this and they said one way to think about it is from the perspective of a small business owner. I love it because that's what Lance and I are. Um, let's say you run your own bakery. You sell bread for $4 a loaf. You getting this, Lance? I got it. You got your four bucks? Yep. Okay. Today, you sold 90 loaves. Right. $360. $360 in revenue. You expect that because it's a busier day at the bakery tomorrow, you'll sell 100 loaves, which would earn you $400. But you'd like to sell even more than that, of course. So you lower the price 
to three dollars a loaf to encourage additional purchases. Okay. All all pretty logical I'm there. so far, right? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going in to buy it. Congratulations. You sold 125 loaves of bread. Your revenue goes up to $375. Mm-hmm. From $360. Right. That's more than you brought in the day before. Right. Your price cut, though, has not, quote, paid for itself, end quote, because you ended up bringing in less revenue than you would have otherwise. I had, I had to, I had more flour, more everything. My expenses were higher, yes. but I also made only three seventy five versus the four hundred I could have made had I kept the price high. Yeah, they sum it up by saying, in other words, you brought in more money than the day before, but it's less than you would have made if you hadn't cut the price. So if we hadn't had the tax cut, and more people had been working, all these people now are working, the government would have brought in more tax dollars. Right. It's the equivalent of selling more loaves, but earning less money. Gotcha. So by several measures, post-tax cut revenues have not grown at all. That's why we saw in the 2018 fiscal year with tax cuts, a few months before they passed, the Congressional Budget Office predicted the government would take in $3.53 trillion in revenues for the fiscal year. On Monday, the Treasury reported that revenue was actually $3.33 trillion for the year, a $200 billion shortfall, even though economic growth has outpaced the budget deficit's forecasts, the equivalent of selling more loaves but earning less money. And at the same time, the Republicans have – folks, I'm not trying to bash – I know it's going to come off that way, but I'm not trying to bash the Republicans, but they've controlled both houses of Congress. And what spending bills, what spending cuts have they made in their spending bills? I mean, if they can ram Judge Kavanaugh through confirmation and they can, you know, put in changes into the Affordable Care Act and all of those things, why haven't they stepped up as Republicans and cut the amount of government spending to attempt to balance the budget, which is what the Republicans have been all about for the last 25, 30 years, is we want to cut the deficit. And so here you have the opportunity. I mean, what an opportunity. A Republican president with a Republican-controlled Congress, and now spending is up and tax dollars collected are down. Sounds like the Republicans are doing – what they always accuse the Democrats of doing. And and we've we've pointed this out the whole time. It it, it sums up here, because then the question that comes to mind, right, is but revenue is definitely growing after the tax cuts, right? I mean, we're bringing in more, right? Well, no. Uh, the fiscal year runs from the start of October to the end of September. And for those of you that don't know, it's just the government, for whatever reason, you know, they like to be strange. So their year is from October to September instead of January to December, like the rest of us. The tax cuts mostly took effect in January 2018. That means three months of the 2018 fiscal year included a period without the tax cuts in place. If you took only, if you look only at the nine months after the cuts took effect, you'll see that revenue is ever so slightly down year over year. From January through September of 2017, revenues were $2.57 trillion. For the same period in 2018, they were $2.56 trillion, which is to say they're down by $10 billion in a direct comparison after the tax cuts started. Personal, personal tax receipts are up on their own, but corporate tax receipts are down by about a third from a year ago. That overall drop looks worse when you consider inflation, i.e. a dollar today buys about 2% less than it did a year ago, according to the Federal Reserve. So the government brought in slightly less money year over year, and that money was worth less than the equivalent amount a year ago, which means it buys fewer meals for troops, materials for highway construction, or any of the other goods and services that tax dollars go toward which is, by the way, exactly what forecasters predicted. All of this information is not a revelation. It was all given by the Congressional Budget Office, a nonpartisan entity, to Congress to say that 
it don't look like this is going to add up to a good positive, you know, because the argument, right, Lance, is we do this, it stimulates growth. And in the long run, if we sell for less, we'll have more total. If we have more people paying taxes, it's okay if they're paying less in taxes because we'll have more people working, so we'll collect more money. Except as we learn with the bread example, it's not that simple. Right. Because yeah, well, if you cut well, prices enough- from, from the Treasury Department, it's not working. Right. It's that simple. Now, this, re- this isn't the yeah. media going in and saying, making up numbers. This is, as you said, from the Treasury Department and from the Congressional Budget Office, that the facts are that, yes, more people are working, but the tax rate was so low that we are not bringing in as much money as anticipated. So, therefore, the budget deficit is increasing on a daily basis. We got just enough time left, Lance, I think, to squeeze in one just, you know, hey, here's what's going on. What do you what do you want it to be? We, we're talking about the journalist or what What do we got? Well, I kind of feel like we should since it's the on the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Um, Front page top, of both. Top fold of both the Khashoggi mystery. Um, in the New York Times, the article is four suspects identified in the Khashoggi mystery have links to the prince. Um, in the Wall Street Journal, the title of the article is New Details Emerge in the Saudi Case. Um, in the New York Times, there are two different articles side by side. One entitled Trump Jumps to the Kingdom's Defense. The others, Members of the Official Saudi Agencies. So basically, um, four people have been identified by the, the Turkish government. Uh, four suspects have been identified. And one is a, and a fifth one is a forensic doctor. So all of these people have ties to um, the prince of Saudi Arabia who's in charge. And they're saying that how can uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman say that he's not involved when these people would not be allowed to leave the country unless he said it was okay, that they are personal attendants to him, personal people who work for him. Um, but President Trump says to the associate, to an interview with the Associated Press in the White House uh, yesterday, he said, quote, here we go again with your guilty until proven innocent. So President Trump is saying that we really don't know what's going on yet. Now, I would hope that the Americans in charge of getting the president the information are giving him all of the information. And if that is true, it's hard to see where the president wouldn't have some of this information that we're getting from the Turkish government. How can the Turkish government give us this information and the president seem like he's not aware of it? Um, so well, he's either not actually aware of it or feigning well, it, it's both sure, of which is we've talked about are equally bad. I, I, I don't want to, ways. you know, but it sure sounds. I don't want to do this, but it sure sounds like he's just being a mouthpiece for the Saudi government. Well, we've had this long history, right? Just to harken back here, because we got to wrap it up. We'll leave you to think about this. We've had a long history with uh, Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. and uh, it's one that I think you all should look into a little closer. Do we really want to support what they stand for? I don't know, but something to think about because every president just kind of, well, you know, you're 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 our buddies. Well, and the other one, and j- just quickly, is and, that. Well, the president says we can't lose the military deal. Okay, they've been buying stuff us from us stuff from us for fifty years. Yeah, they can't just switch the Chinese version or the Russian version because it's not compatible. The computers and the programs don't work. Yep. So they're kind of tied into us. So as we are to them, which is two things to think about. Yep. Thank you all for tuning in. Let us know what you think of the new format at TrueChatORG, Facebook, Twitter, and more. Find The State of Us anywhere fine podcasts are found. For The State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. And I'm Lance Jackson. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time on The State of Us. Be the change.